Welcome to day two of the first North American BCP focused scientific conference. My name is Sujata Patel and I'm on the organizing committee for the uh, BCP scientific conference. Uh, day one yesterday was filled with a lot of information and uh, conversation surrounding BCP disease. Um, we definitely had our share of technology issues. Uh, so again, we appreciate your patience as we worked through those issues. And I thank you in advance today for any IT issues we might have. So uh, thank you for your patience. So we have about 135 people registered for this event uh, who participated throughout the day yesterday, uh, which was really fantastic. And then I'm also happy to announce that we have a, somebody who has volunteered to publish the findings um, of this uh, scientific conference. So we're really thankful. Thank you very much. Um, regarding the expo, I hope that many of you have had a chance to go and look at the incredible posters and listen to some of the presentations there. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet, I encourage you to go to the expos uh, and, and take a look. Um, also for the presenters, um, I would encourage you to also kind of check back with your expo um, with your poster. Um, some people are leaving messages or trying to kind of chat with you. So go ahead and check back there as well. Um, so I also wanted to make mention that the we are awarding prizes for the top abstracts and oral presentations. Um, and part of the judging process is to uh, take it, it takes into account uh, participation from the audience, as well as questions. So, you know, please do visit the expos and the posters, um, and then we will be announcing the uh, top prize winners, the three top prize winners, on Monday through email and on social media. Um, also, the expo will be available to you till 8 p.m. on Saturday tomorrow, September 12th. So, if you don't have a chance today, go ahead and, you know, use your Saturday to, to take a look at all of them. There are some really great things there. Um, I also hope that some of you had a chance to use the networking feature. We had about 43 of you um, use that platform yesterday and it was really, really a wonderful way to connect. And this is really our best attempt to kind of create an in-person or a water cooler experience in this virtual setting. Um, so I encourage you to participate if, if if you're willing, if you have the time. Uh, we do have another networking session scheduled for this afternoon at 12.30. And, um, and I also wanted to let you know that if um, I, I think probably most people have their chat opened on the right hand side. But if you click on people, at the very bottom, there's a meeting, uh, there's a uh, button that says schedule a meeting and you can actually schedule a one on one meeting with anybody that you want to connect with specifically. So it's a little different from the, the networking feature, which is a, a random five minute interaction with somebody that um, you have the opportunity to meet. So today we are excited for another day of information, sharing, networking and learning. Um, and we encourage you through these sessions to start and to join into conversations. Um, our goal is to stimulate thought and direction for scientific research uh, to understand the disease better and to get us closer to a treatment or a cure. And we are honored, truly honored, to have the greatest minds in the field of VCP disease gathered in this virtual space. Um, so we really highly encourage you to challenge ideas, introduce new ideas, uh, interject your professional opinions uh, as the day unfolds and as the presentations are shared. Our sessions today will have the same format as yesterday. So we will have a panel of speakers and the speakers will present their, uh, their content and then we will open it up to Q&A. Um, I recognize that we don't have a lot of breaks and we didn't have a lot of breaks yesterday. And you know, the reason for this is because there's so much to discuss. Uh, we wanted to keep the, tight, uh, the schedule tight so that um, you know, we're in this, in this conference and then uh, we're kind of out of the conference, but we wanted to keep everything tight. So thank you for understanding that, that part of it. Um, if you have any questions or any concerns, or I think some people had some issues with the app yesterday, the hop in app. So if you have any hop in app uh, issues and you are using the app, I would encourage you to go ahead and log in using your PC and that should alleviate any issues that you're having. 
Um, again, during our during our sessions, if you have any questions that you want to ask of the speakers, you can post them in the chat or you can request to share your audio and your video. Um, I also want to once again thank our speakers, our participants, our industry partners, uh, the organizing committee and sponsors for making this scientific conference possible. And specifically, uh, I want to thank our financial sponsors, the uh, Muscular Dystrophy Association, All Stripes, Every Life Foundation for Rare Disease, and Cure BCP Disease. I'd so like to introduce our keynote speakers for today. We have Dr. George Tolomachenko, uh, who is the executive director at the Merkin Institute for Translational Research at Caltech. And then we will also be having Dr. Barbara Wold uh, join us. And she is the director of the Beckman Institute at Caltech. And they will be speaking about the very important topic of translational research. So she, uh, just, just to correct, she was the director of the Beckman Institute. She's currently the director of the Merkin Institute. So she'll definitely be speaking and focused on the, the Merkin Institute, the newest kid on the block of institutes uh, here at Caltech. So. Thank you, George, for that correction. I appreciate it. So I will let you take it away, George. Okay. Well, Barbara has just joined me right here. So I'll let Barbara take it away. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yes. Thank, thank you. A small computer glitch, but fortunately our offices are, are near to each other. Uh, so thanks so much for inviting us to do this mini panel. It's great to be here. Um, uh, we're coming to you from Caltech and the Merkin Institute for Translational Research. And we wish you were all here in person. Desperately, we wish that that was the case and darn COVID for making it not possible. Hopefully it will happen sometime in the not too distant future that everybody will be here in person. Uh, so I thought it'd be uh, useful to start uh, with the way we're thinking about uh, the translational framework and then how that might map to BCP. Uh, so the classic framework is the bench to bedside kind of model. It's got a natural push from basic discovery through preclinical research to patient treatment. And uh, there's a piece that I'm going to come to shortly that's about uh, trying to crank up sort of a, a novel pull direction that we've got uh, with an innovation program at Merkin that we think might have elements that might be useful, uh, particularly to VCP. Um, we think about contemporary translation much more as a cycle. Um, the discovery being driven by patient data and patient participation. Um, so in that case, feedback from the preclinical to new basic discovery and from patient to basic discovery, elements which were always the, there become a lot more important now than they probably were in the past. And they've really been enabled by data sharing practices, much of which started in my own field of genomics. Um, so now thinking about how to map contemporary translation for VCP. Um, so we've thought about it a little. We know we're naive. Uh, we don't work on the problem full time. Uh, I'm just hoping that there's going to be a nugget or two along the way that you'll actually take out and say, well, yeah, that might actually work. Um, we, we don't think that we've got uh, the snappy solution for everything. Um, so, uh, in speaking with Shafen uh, and others who work on the problem, the sense that this is at a stage where there's still much more to be figured out about mechanisms that are going to be directly pertinent to how you target them with drugs or how you target them with therapies. So some uh, rare disease uh, um, problems that I know about from uh, other contacts and from teaching genetics are at other stages. And it may be that they're just um, uh, going straight for gene therapy and that's obvious. I think for VCP, basic mechanism still has a great deal to say about what might be the final therapeutic solutions, particularly as it breaks out into its three different phenotypes. Um, Preclinical research, uh, you're already doing a lot, uh, as far as I can tell and learn, about convening and coordinating collaborations. So I think this is a place where a uh, foundation such as this and a group such as this can really have a big impact, um, very disproportionate to the number of dollars needed to do it. Um, and finally, the crucial particip 
participation of the patients as data donors, you're already building the registry, which is absolutely key. And, and I have a special place in my life and my heart for uh, simply shortening the diagnostic odyssey. Um, I happen to have in my extended family nephews with MPS4, also called Morquio syndrome. And I've been on that diagnostic odyssey with them, which for them lasted almost 20 years. And uh, it would have been much better for them uh, had it been foreshortened. And so when you've got phenotypes that can be mistaken for something else, it's super important to have the genetics and the awareness out there in the community. And I just want to shout out. Um, I also want to say, by the way, that your website treatment of advice about testing to different people with different positions relative to an affected patient is one of the smartest and best I've ever seen. Um, so back to Merkin. Uh, I just want to say that uh, all that happens at Merkin is mainly done by others than me, uh, and particularly Dan Schwartz as the physician in residence and George, whom you met briefly and who's going to do uh, um, a good portion of this talk uh, as the executive director that really animates things around here, are absolutely key. And they work very closely with the Caltech entrepreneurs in residence. And I bring them up because they're an important part of the models that I'll talk about. And uh, without them, uh, things would not go nearly as well as they do. Um, so. We've been doing something called the Innovation Symposia at the Merkin, and this is an amplification of an earlier program that uh, was begun by Dan Schwartz, the now the PIR, uh, before he held that position, together with the Nobel chemist, Bob Grubbs. And so this model is up and running, and we know that it works. And uh, we're moving it over, doing it more frequently, and adding seed money in order to grow partner projects that come out of these innovation symposia. And I think there may be ways in which you can tweak this model that might be good for VCP. Uh, so we've done these on a number of different subjects from a timely COVID to neurosurgery, telemedicine, cardiology, and so on. We have not yet done a rare genetic disease thing, but that's a yet. And I think that's probably something that we want to talk to you about and um, see what such a rare genetic disease theme would look like for the innovation program. Um, so, so how does this actually work? Uh, so you can think of it as a pyramid building from the bottom to the top. And the starting point are these symposia. So we're using our convening powers. You guys could use your convening powers, or maybe we could combine forces on VCP. But but the point is to gather together people who wouldn't normally be talking. And particularly here uh, for the problems that we've been doing for Caltech, we're really interested, since we don't have a medical school, in talking very directly with top flight clinicians uh, working in a given field who have identified a problem that they said, if you could solve this one problem, it would really make a rate limiting difference in the lives of our patients and our ability to treat them. And so these things can be uh, big cures or they can be uh, just very important incremental steps in how patients are treated. Um, the idea is to put this in front of a bunch of scientists and engineers who perhaps don't know the problem at all or know it only tangentially and have a brainstorming session that attracts and begins to forge collaborations. And uh, not every problem finds a collaborator. Not every interested collaborator finds a problem they think they can do something about. But the hit rate is amazingly good. There are usually two projects coming out of each of these symposia that go forward and turn into uh, actually executed projects. Um, the project assessment, the green uh, part of the pyramid, is also really important. This is bringing experts who are not actually the people who are the body of the collaboration to take a look at it and bring in more expertise on the clinical side if it's headed for commercial purposes to evaluate what the IP would likely be, who the competition is, and so forth. 
or just evaluate the need and scientific uh, um, uh, feasibility. Um, so then there's finding sources of funding. That's always the big, the blue one is the puzzling one. At Merkin, we're now providing some seed money and seeking matching funds from our clinical partners. But one can imagine that this is the kind of thing where what ultimately forms a seed grant to a project in one of these collaborations is comes from more than one source. It comes from participants. It comes from interested philanthropy. It may come from the foundation. Um, the thing after doing roughly a year's worth, sometimes six months, sometimes 18 months worth of proof of principle, there's a progress report to that seed grant. There's timeline refinement about how to go forward if it's successful, but this is a no, a, a go, no go point. And, and the truth of the matter is, it's really important to know how to say, that was a good thing to pursue. It's not really going to go forward and have super impact. That's not where we want to put resources going forward, either scientific or financial. But if it passes, if it's a go, then more funding and usually at a larger scale is needed. And so I'll come back to that uh, in just a second. So as I say, um, uh, these things have been done and some of them that began under Grubbs and Schwartz prior to Merkin, which is a new institute, uh, actually have developed into successful companies. Um, others are major ongoing collaborations with substantial funding from outside sources. Um, so, uh, what about the possibility of adapting these elements of Merkin innovation for VCP? So, this is a little bit of random brainstorming from George and I. Uh, we hope that there are some elements in here that might actually be applicable and helpful. Uh, so getting symposia to focus on very specific aspects, I could imagine in VCP, perhaps building it around each aspect of the three major phenotypes. Um, this is a terrific way to attract new talent to your problem. And, and that alone, and that new talent is at all career stages. So we invite lead PIs uh, that might have something to say about a clinical uh, problem into these innovation symposia for the brainstorming session, but they are invited to bring key interested students and postdocs. And so they get to sit in these really intense sessions. We're now doing them by Zoom. They go on for an afternoon for about four hours, and it's like watching jazz musicians uh, doing terrific um, uh, ad-libbing. It's, it's just it's a really exciting scientific experience and it gets students and postdocs rightly excited. Um, the big thing about forging these collaborations is beyond that first tickle in the symposium. I mean, that's not so hard to get and you do want to winnow out the things that after you sleep on it, you really want to do. People keep talking to each other, but the place where um, the foundation, for example, can play a role is beyond convening and on follow through and on trust building. So in a field on a very specific problem like VCP, there will be uh, almost inevitably, if it's like any other scientific field, the fact that some of the best collaborations actually bring together people who have previously competed with each other. Um, and in other cases, you're putting together people who don't know each other and who aren't at the same institution. And in both of these cases, getting the follow through to build it forward and building trust as you go about sharing more and more information, uh, information long before publication, that's what's really necessary to make a collaborative project work. Um, the assessment is key. It's been a really, really great thing. Uh, Dan has organized groups of experts to come in and look as something is uh, contemplating going out and deciding whether it's going to be a company. And this is where our entrepreneurs in residence have also played a key role. And bringing that kind of talent to the table is another way to use your convening powers. Now, the sources of seed funding uh, are going to vary. And it probably can't all come from you uh, unless, unless there's a um, printing press for dollars. But it's amazing what you can do with a little bit of seed money and some seed money 
at other places. So, for example, at Caltech, uh, a PI would have access possibly to Merkin money. We have a Chen Institute for the neuroscience part of it. Um, and, and then there's you guys. Uh, once some seed grants are launched, it's the go, no go. And then there's the need for expanded funding if you're really going to make something go into the clinic. And there are two models, the more conventional models, the arrow to the right, where you're headed for startup companies or uh, um, getting the project to go because a big pharma company gets interested in it. Um, and that's all great. That's a way to bring the capital you need for the expended funding to really make it happen. Um, there's another model. It's not as prevalent, and I think it's interesting to think about and maybe interesting for you guys to think about. And it's a not-for-profit model. And one example that I'm aware of is at the University of Iowa in um, uh, rare genetic diseases that affect the retina. There are about 100 of them, and they've stood up a GMP facility because the retina is accessible for gene therapy. So this isn't necessarily going to be directly transferable to VCP, although there may be strategies that involve gene therapy kinds of activities. But what is interesting is that they've set it up as a nonprofit and they're attracting philanthropy to be part of that extra funding uh, to be able to offer this um, to affected people at cost which is their model. Um, so more partnering and leveraging, uh, um, brainstorming the rate limiting steps and getting joint resources is uh, a tough activity. It's a big activity, but that piece where you figure out what's rate limiting, and I know you're doing some of those things today, uh, is probably one of the most important uses of convening powers uh, and colloquia. Um, identifying infrastructure uh, for the various VCP research paths that are deemed the critical paths. And here, the contract research organizations, uh, if you as a community can identify the ones that are good, that you trust, uh, that's sometimes uh, a way to go that expands your powers of experimentation beyond what's immediately doable by PIs uh, on their own. And that's the kind of thing, the list of the CROs that are really good to work with is an invaluable list. Um, and then keeping track through your investigators of university facilities that can be used and sometimes can be used by outside entities and working the best deals. You may have powers to navigate and negotiate good deals in using university facilities. Uh, connecting the existing and new collaborators. So we talked about the innovation colloquia. Um, one of the things under the hood that's really rate limiting we find in translation are the um, benefits of setting up a memoranda of understanding between institutions that can often lower barriers, eliminate cross overhead costs in the most extreme cases. I mean, these can be hugely valuable in getting the research done. Um, when it comes to the work with humans and involving people from multiple institutions, uh, helping to get their IRBs to approve compatible um, uh, consents is no small deal. And that's a place where you can really, it's not particularly visible, but it can really make a difference in lowering the barriers to getting things done. And finally, recruiting in young students and postdocs, we're doing a thing at the Merkin with little translational spark projects, just you know, 10K for people to work on a little bit part-time to try and just get a glimmer of first data in a direction, which in your case would be about VCP. Uh, and running such a program doesn't need to be hugely expensive in order to attract interests and get something started. Um, so I think I'm gonna turn it over to George to talk about mapping uh, other kinds of resources onto Cure VCP. George? Thank you, Barbara. Uh, hi. Uh, and I took as a starting point uh, the specific objectives that VCP outlines. And um, as Barbara uh, said, um, you have a very good web, web page on genetic testing. Uh, and, and I think what I'm going to do it for some of these points is just sort of 
give some examples from my own background. I'm relatively new to the Merkin Institute, but I do have experience with uh, uh, healthcare focused foundations, funding research, uh, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of Canada. Uh, is in my background, so I'll talk a little bit from that. And more recent experience at the hospital level of implementing um, uh, programs that enable innovation. Um, these were largely focused on pediatric and device innovation, but there can be, and I'm trying to focus on um, points that are relevant or potentially relevant for uh, VCP. So. Uh, one of your aims to provide global education and awareness uh, of, uh, of VCP diseases to doctors, researchers, industry, patients, caregivers, and the general public. Um, and I like to characterize this as, you know, uh, moving from genetic counseling version 1.0 to genetic counseling version 2.0. And while I was at um, working uh, prior to the Merck and I was at the University of California at Irvine, um, where there is a genetics counseling program, and um, Dr. Kimonis is actually very much involved with that program. Um, I was advocating for taking a look under the hood uh, and actually opening up new um, sort of channels that would help educate um, new genetic, uh, sort of, a, I call it here, a new echelon of counselors who are more in tune with advances in science because. One of the problems that I'm sure you all face is um, that interface between cutting edge molecular biology, the science, and the clinicians who um, uh, are in, in, in a way uh, flummoxed sometimes by uh, the detail, level of genomic detail that's available to them and how do they sort through it. So in some ways, genetic counseling um, is in need of scientists who can train clinicians to interpret data. And so in some ways, uh, you know, it's not just the families who need some counseling, it could be the clinicians as well. And so I was, I was in, the, in the midst of, um, you know, helping focus in that area. And one way to stimulate that interface um, at the Children's Hospital of Orange County, um, I helped uh, begin the process of setting up uh, a component of a data science program so that graduate students can choose to work on a rare disease data set and use that as part of their master's thesis. So uh, rather than getting into the details of that, there is a web link here and we will share this presentation afterwards so you can get at that. that. And which reminds me, I have um, some of these uh, uh, points here, but I will also, at, after. It, after we close up, there, there's some other slides with some uh, websites and uh, particular um, links that um, you uh, in your group are probably already familiar with. And, and that's one of the sort of things I'm nervous about in presenting is, is am I <laughs> um, bringing coal to Newcastle here? With, and I apologize for that in, in advance if, if some of this is quite uh, overlaps with what, what you know already. Um, so, your effort um, is laudable in, on, to develop uh, and maintain a global patient registry of VCP patients. So, uh, how do we, how do you do this uh, with, uh, you know, as, you know, you're at the very early stage of this and, you know, uh, and from my perspective, it might make sense to collaborate with larger partners as you do uh, with Nord. Um, they have the I Am Rare registry and there's a link there for that. Um, and more recently, the FDA has funded a rare disease cures accelerator data analytics platform. I was familiar with this because it links with the program um, to uh, encourage graduate students to look at rare disease data sets. Um, the CPATH program um, will be a repository for that level of data um, across different diseases. and getting in early and being very familiar with that um, program it would be uh, uh, advisable um, because it allows you to leverage their resources. I mean, when the FDA funded this program, um, I think it was at, a, uh, at approximately $12 million, so it was a significant level of funding. And then there's also the Global Alliance for Genomic Health. Um, they're uh, an excellent organization for um, this um, level of data um, 
sharing and standardization uh, across different diseases. Um, so in collaborations, uh, I think one of the things to be, and I'm sure uh, uh, you're uh, very aware of this, that you know you need to be strategic in your in your partnering. Um, and I know uh, Maureen Hart came from Global Genes, and that's how I met her first uh, while I was at UCI. Um, and uh, um, one of the outcomes of that those discussions with Global Genes was uh, uh, the uh, a seminar on accelerating rare disease diagnosis using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, this link will take you to that uh, seminar. Um, and uh, hopefully that's something that, um, you, you know, you, you will be uh, work toward your advantage in terms of getting, in, you know, finding people outside of the traditional sort of realm of, of uh, stakeholders with rare diseases. And one of, the, one of this, these groups is uh, sort of the burgeoning field of, uh, not burgeoning, but dominating field of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So giving uh, them uh, those sort of uh, folks a, a foothold or a pathway into exploring and using their tools on data um, that is relevant to VCP. Um, and then sort of on a sort of uh, more at an administrative level, uh, you know, proactive planning during uh, uh, COVID, how do you do research during COVID? In some ways, um, it's, it's a, a, a setting during which data sharing um, can actually, through digital media, through digital connections is more uh, common now than it was before because of the uh, um, remote um, nature of collaboration sort of that was forced upon everyone at the beginning of COVID. Um, so one of these re remote collaborations and there's, uh, uh, is it, and the outcome, uh, and I'm giving this as an example because when I worked at uh, UCI and the Children's Hospital of Orange County, one of the things we did was we very much wanted to be in tune with where the pain points for um, pediatric device innovation were. So, you know, translate that over to VCP. Where are the, the pain points? I think Barbara referred to them as rate limiting points. And so I think anticipating how to interact with the FDA might may be one of these areas. And one thing we did was, well, let's convene, uh, since we know the FDA having funded the, the Critical Path Institute and this new focus on rare diseases in particular within the Critical Path Institute might be a way for VCP to, to help convene or make convening more attractive to a larger network. Um, and this is what we did with the um, Pediatric Device Consortia. These are five uh, um, areas or five regions that have uh, FDA grants for pediatric device innovation. And we use them or uh, that sort of network to bring in people interested in working with the FDA to understand um, where, bo where bottlenecks were occurring and how to sort of um, smoothen things. In some ways, it's parallel to the memorandum of understanding uh, across institutions around IRBs. You want to have kind of a join forces with um, different groups that have similar um, desire to sort of smooth in the path or blaze a trail with uh, FDA and understand who to connect with on the inside there. So this, this paper was published in an engineering journal and recently on just, uh, really it's a paper on <laughs> convening um, panels on making recommendations. And at the, at the end of the day, it was, you know, um, just a couple of recommendations, but it was more importantly, um, people knew who to talk with at the FDA. People knew um, what consultants were were helpful um, in advocating for specific um, uh, specific areas. So I'll highlight uh, Allison Kuma, Kumiyama was a FDA um, device um, consultant, but she really has a special place in her heart for. Uh, pediatric devices. So this is, you know, find people like that who have a special place in their hearts for 
uh, rare disease, and in particular, uh, BCP would be would be uh, a good find and uh, a useful ally going forward. Um, so it, this last slide, yes, this last slide is ma mainly on um, looking at and again being strategic about hosting and participating in events that can be helpful uh, what, um, to the cause or different um, aims of VC for that you've outlined in BCP. So, um, you know, one tool that pops up over and over again are, are you know hackathons, and you know, the one one uh, one recipe for for bringing people from different areas who are thinkers and doers. Uh, so, you know, think, uh, how do you attract thinkers and doers from other fields is to have a hackathon. But three quarters or more of, the, of a hackathon is setting it up right. Um, you know, what is the aim? Who are you going to invite? Or how are you going to open an invitation that will attract people from different areas? Um, and uh, that's uh, uh, the spade work that needs to be done in advance to the foundation for for an event like that. So uh, I can, um, you know, again, part of that is bringing multiple stakeholders, um, looking at previous hackathons. Uh, so there will be one in March 2022 hosted by uh, Children's Hospital Orange County, Global Genes, and UCI School of Medicine that might be useful to participate in, at, you know, to bring, uh, to, to, you know, get involved in, in, in that. And I'm happy to make introductions um, for, for that um, particular event. Now, um, I, I want to acknowledge that we started early uh, and one of the messages I heard before we started was how little time there was in between sessions. Um, and now we're at uh, um, 7.38, so I think we're at uh, what would have been our end time. Uh, um, so, uh, and I invite Barbara back here. And I hope, because we don't see, like when I'm looking at this uh, screen, I don't see myself. So I hope you didn't see me lurking in the background uh, while Barbara was talking, uh, but we're both here. Um, and, and the final slide is, where we would have wanted to see you here at Caltech. And, and we do hope to see you at some time in the not too distant future. So thank you, Barb and George, for a wonderful uh, discussion, uh, all of your insight and the resources that you've provided. I think that we're definitely uh, setting the stage to turn collaborations into uh, BCP disease expanded funding uh, and, you know, kind of leveraging that work or in that funding to our common goal, which, you know, ultimately is to find a, a treatment for our disease. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Whether you want to post it in the chat or uh, request that your audio and video be shared? Uh, comments in the chat. Uh, Virginia Camonis uh, has said that UCI and CHOC submitted a joint application for a Nord Rare Disease uh, Center of Excellence. And then uh, Nathan uh, says that, oh, hi, Nathan. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you speak hey, for Nathan. yourself. <laughs> well, yeah, so I was going to ask on the hackathons, because we've heard of a lot of other organizations doing that. So is the Merkin helping establish that, or you help organizations for how to approach that, or you get others involved? I mean, and I'd love to hear from the other attendees, I mean, are hackathons, have you done those before? Are they valuable? Um, because we've heard of a lot of people doing, or other organizations, rare disease organizations doing it. I just, I wouldn't even know where to begin. You know, how do you even start? I, I mean, what themes? Uh, so just guidance, is that something, George, that, that y'all provide guidance on that or how to approach it? I could probably, um, it's interesting because a lot has happened since I left UCI and my colleagues sent me about 24 pages of work that went into the background, uh, you know, setting that up, you know, and uh, uh, I don't, uh, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't uh, include it here, but uh, you're right, it's an important um, activity before 
and to kind of specify a target. We haven't done it here yet. We don't have a, a user's guide for hackathons at this no, point. No, but I think, I think actually the, the valuable thing, Nathan, is actually sitting down with someone who has organized one that the participants agree and the field agree, you know, maybe a year back or two years back where they can actually say, it didn't just feel good, it was actually successful. And, uh, you know, making a link, which I think George can probably do for you, uh, and then sitting with them and saying, okay, which things map for VCP and which ones don't, and what were the critical things that might be general? And I think that kind of contact is invaluable. I, I go that route. Follow somebody for whom it worked. Yeah. yeah. No, I, we understand it. You know, the sincerest form of flattery is copying what, what somebody else did. So, um, okay, great. And, and I did, I did make a comment about the FDA. I mean, we did that FDA listening session and it was yes. so valuable. And, and I want everybody that's on to understand this. We do have connections within the FDA. Um, even when we were designing this natural history study, we were able to kind of get on the bat phone with the FDA um, and have an audience with them because they knew what we were about and what we, you know, the burden of disease. And um, so for anybody that ever wants to, you know, connections with the FDA, we can help with that and, because and we have to establish that. Some key words there would be real world evidence um, and how the FDA is looking at um, uh, ways of um, putting together uh, in real world evidence that has been gathered in a methodical way. So your registry is one sort of uh, uh, activity that aligns with that. But just to make sure that uh, down the road, um, when it comes time to uh, uh, assemble the evidence for um, the FDA, you can use a lot that's out there already because you've followed sort of guidance around real world evidence gathering and organization. Yeah, and the, the other thing that, that we found valuable and that might arise for various of the projects that uh, as they progress is um, uh, there are some times when it's too early to talk to the FDA, but those times are rare. If you can get an audience, they, they uh, doing it sooner can just cut out an enormous amount of waste and weigh up the odds and important to all of you and your patients foreshorten the timeline on something because uh, particularly things that are driven forward uh, as, as projects um, around a place like Caltech that's very basic science oriented often in that case people are taking something all the way through to solution maybe for the one and only first time in their careers and that means they're not doing it with all that experience about when to talk to FDA and that's where you guys can make a huge difference. Uh, agreed. And, and yeah, actually, just keep doing that. <laughs> uh, no, uh, uh, Lindsay, who's, uh, I think she's on right now, will be presenting later. We did that call with the FDA with her. She was the PI, um, you know, and because we wanted to kind of get their blessing first, or at least grease the wheels a little bit um, ahead of time that we weren't chasing the wrong rabbit, you know, that you know, they were going to ding us later or we were wasting time and money. At least they recognize that it is a rabbit. Right. Right. Well, the FDA, FDA to think it's an FDA rabbit. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't mean to jump in on this, Sujata. So other questions or comments from anybody? Okay, well, if we don't have any other questions, I think we're actually going to have a break today. Um, first thing in the morning, of course. George and Barbara, thank you again. Get, get so that much. coffee. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Get the thank coffee. There are hold, other on, things hold on, the hold on. Chris, Chris has a question. Oh, okay. Chris, oh. Chris. Um, Chris you got to hit me. I'm unmuted. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. So, so you brought up an interesting point, which is this kind of single person driving the ship. Um, and, and that, you know, they don't have the experience. But, but I will say that is my personal feeling about these types of endeavors, that they require a single motivated clinician scientist to really bring the whole thing through. And I guess I'd like to hear, you know, a comment or two about um, 
about the importance of that leader and and what makes that kind of successful. So uh, you're right, the model of the driving force leader, even if it's leading what ultimately is a consortium, is uh, it's almost always essential. Uh, I mean, that that's trivial to say. Uh, I think uh, the more interesting thing is how do you harness it if you've got two driving forces or three driving forces? So I'd, I'd say from the experience of genome science, getting multiple drivers that nevertheless are pointed at the same overall objective and getting that to actually synergize is, uh, is really one of the most interesting challenges in translation. You don't always need it. Sometimes there's an individual can, that can take it all the way through. And there's the, the piece about what does it look like on the timeline of trajectory from the earliest discovery all the way through. And sometimes you just have to bring in other talent and other approaches uh, in order to actually get it over the finish line. And so I guess the driving force needs to be there. Uh, and at the same time, sometimes at least some openness to letting in another, uh, another driver, a co-driver. Um, and sometimes it means that an early driver actually goes to the sidelines for a little while while something else that's rate limiting has to be done. And so I guess, I guess our experience is it comes in many models. And the simple model, which is the driver from beginning to end is great when it works, but openness uh, to some of these things that can make it actually go faster, but involve multiples is something we might be worthwhile. I guess I guess an, another challenge I see, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, are, um, you know, some of what you're describing is not funded. It's kind of, you know, personal, uh, you know, th we all have competing interests, including our own personal lives. Like, I, I, I guess, um, are there mechanisms to try to um, offer support in some ways financially through either you know um not personal financially but but to, to help um to help with this i guess is, is kind of what i'm thinking uh, so so uh um uh if that question is either either broadly or narrowly is that a question of us in particular or is that a question broadly about broadly how, how you get help from broadly because the the answer is probably the same broadly as it is for us and that is uh you know that thing about what fraction of one's time goes into a different kind of outreach where where for one reason or another you have the expertise to contribute and first of all can you identify such people and if invited uh will they have the bandwidth and do it and I guess for exciting problems with important, compelling goals in the patient population, uh, I think I've seen, uh, I, I tend to see it around genome institutes. You know, people getting interested because they meet a patient, because they meet a family in a particular thing that doesn't affect their family, but they have some infrastructure that could help. And sometimes the problem is they don't have the money to make the infrastructure go, but sometimes there are ways to kind of kludge it together on the side. And, and I think those kinds of contexts, and I've seen those things crop up again and again out of Hudson Alpha Institute in Alabama, where uh, I, I know from SAB work, that kind of thing comes up. And so uh, people I think are amazingly willing within the limits of their, of their boundaries, as you say, there's your science life, there's your medical life, there's your personal life, and then there's the life of a problem that isn't the central one you're doing. And uh, I, I find people are amazingly um, uh, willing to jump in. Uh, and part of that is, uh, I think, inspired by what Nathan and company are doing, which is simply making VCP visible. Um, but being visible in some of those places where people could offer help is, is the best.
Great. Very informative Thanks. and insightful session. Thank you again, uh, Barbara and George. Uh, we hope to keep this conversation going uh, as we start to map out and uh, execute our next steps. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, we do hope to keep the conversation going from our side as well. Definitely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. So as this session concludes, I remind you that you need to exit out of this session by clicking, clicking the leave button at the top right corner of your screen and then going into the sessions on the left side of your screen for the next one. Um, we are getting started hmm, in about seven minutes, I guess, 11 o'clock Eastern time. Um, and our next topic is drug discovery. So thank you again for joining us at this keynote uh, session. This session is now ended.